And it's interesting because it's not just that it's, it's an impact on the, um, the operations on the battlefield in West Virginia, but you also mentioned that in the books that it's about uh, food crops too, mm -hmm. that the weather really kind of, you have drought conditions, you have, um, I think you have like a North Carolina or South Carolina farmer who's like, it, he starts planting really late and there's a lot of wetness and it goes to dry and again, what's harvest comes again, wetness. So it's just, it's, I mean, as, as somebody who farms and I, I have a little bit of garden myself, weather can be like the death of your plan. So how does that also impact kind of the, the early war, especially kind of thinking here in terms of the Confederacy is not yet giving up cotton planting, but they need to plant more uh, food crops. How's, how's weather and the climate really also impacting kind of the food situation it's in the country? Crucial. It's, it, it's crucial. I mean, this book is more military history than public mm -hmm. It is. But sometimes I think the most important things I discovered are home currently related, or maybe rediscovered. Over 50 years ago, Paul Gates wrote a book called Agriculture of the Civil War which pointed us towards some of these things. And somehow as a professional, we forgot about the book. So I surely don't claim to be the first to, to discover some of this. But I think using, using the kind of data that exists, especially for the Northern states, I've been able to amplify on it. So everybody watching this probably knows that there are, academically, there are, there are two basic definitions or understandings of why the Confederacy failed. There's the internalist explanation that suggests that the Confederacy fell apart from within because of class differences, racial differences, gender differences, rich man's war, poor man's fight, all those policies coming out of Richmond that alienated the common folk. But there's also been a resurgence of the externalist view, which is that the white Confederacy was pretty united and just lost the war really on the battlefield. And in a way, Lee was right at Appomattox. Um, Federal Army had more men and more supplies and perhaps better leadership. So there's this debate going on. When you factor weather and climate into this argument, I think it changes both of those arguments. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, of drought, yeah, in 1862 and again in 1863, planting started really late because of excessively wet late winters and early spring. So the planter in South Carolina that I use sometimes, I mean, he gets his crops in a month later than normal. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's ever farmed or planted a garden in the house knows that if you lose a month, it's going to affect what you produce. Mm -hmm. In both of those years, 1862 and 1863, you then have massive droughts that spread across the country, especially west of the Appalachians, but I, I certainly I think I've established east of the Appalachians too. You have these massive droughts that basically destroy whatever's in the field. In 1864, um, that situation shifts north. So yeah, Virginia gets hit for a third year in a row. Missouri gets hit for a third year in a row. But now it's, it's the, Atlantic, the Atlantic states and, and the Midwest that are dealing with, with drought conditions. Uh, and then you throw in some really freak weather events in the Midwest in 1863, which cuts food production as well. So in the north, it becomes an issue. I mean, there are areas like the central Illinois where I used to live, where half of their crops are destroyed in the field by two frosts in 1863 that come at the end of the drought. Food production peaks in the north in 1862. That story we were always told that reaping machines and everything else just helped the north produce more and more food during the war. It's false. It's, it's demonstrably false. I mean, government statistics will tell you that. But in the Confederacy, it's even more important because you really do get food shortages. Uh, maybe you don't get to famine or starvation levels, but you really do get food shortages because of these weather conditions, the late planting and then the drought. And so one, one result of that is that the Confederate government in Richmond has to make a really hard choice. We all know that they end up creating policies like the tax and kind or impressment that become really unpopular with civilians at home. 
what's never really adequately explained in books to my satisfaction is why they did that in the first place. It wasn't ideological. It wasn't just because they were, they were bad congressmen sitting around in Richmond. They knew there was only so much food to go around. And let's not forget, the Confederacy had been importing food. Well, no, let's put it this way. The South had been importing food before the war so they could produce more staple crops. They tried to make that shift. They actually give it a fair effort in most cases, but they just don't have any food by the summer of 1862. It's just as bad in 1863. And so they have to make those political decisions. Do we prioritize feeding the army or the civilian population? And when they decide to prioritize feed, feeding the army, that's where you get this, this disillusion, this notion of poor man's fight. But it grows out of a very real situation. When I was in college, I was thinking about this this morning, actually. When I was in college, uh, one of my summer jobs was working on a foundation construction crew. We dug holes and poured concrete and tied steel, and we built foundations for buildings. Mm-hmm. We've had this total internalist argument without its foundation. And I think the foundation is actually in the very odd weather conditions that exist yeah. during the war years. 